Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathleen Lewis, and I'm a curator here at the Air and Space Museum. And I'm welcoming you all to an exciting program we're having for you this afternoon with these two gentlemen. Um, well, they've been together before, and we're bringing them back together in a very unique program. Today, we're going to be talking about music and space. And we have to together this afternoon Fred Gregory, astronaut, former administrator, deputy administrator at, at NASA, and Dr. Michael Nickens, better known as Doc Nick from the George Mason Washington, uh, George Mason University Band. And the reason they're together, believe it or not, these two gentlemen are cousins. Um, uh, uh, astronaut Gregory's mother taught Doc Nickens how to play the piano. That's true. And we're going to talk about music and space because they both have experience with, with music. And we're going to talk in front, of the in front of the Space Shuttle Discovery to talk about what's important about music 
and why music is important in space as well as here on Earth. So, first of all, just to give us a background, how is music important in both of your lives? Could you just explain what it makes does for you? Well, for me, uh, it began as a, a curiosity that, um, you know, it's, especially with a piano, it's something I could sit at myself, by myself, and work out things on my own, uh, learning to read the music, learning to just listen and see if I could recreate things I'd heard before, and then, you know, uh, building a sense of accomplishment as I just set out to learn something, set out to try something, and then it becomes something that I, a, a skill I acquire or uh, a, a fortunate accident that I found something that I, you know, enjoy or, or, or uh, is just, at least is interesting or something like that. And then as I went through school, went through, through middle school and high school, uh, it became a, 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 a mo like a way to build kind of status for myself, become a section leader, become a student conductor, become a drum major, um, composer. Um, and then the idea was I could go to college and study this as a, as a discipline and with the thought that maybe one day I could be hired to be a performer, to be a teacher, to be a composer. Um, and all those things have come true. I, I, I do all, all of those things and uh, how blessed I am to be able to do that at George Mason University, which is 30 minutes away from where I grew up. My family is all around the area and, um, and then things like this can come together like today. So that's in a nutshell what a lot of music, what music has been for me. I grew up in a, a family of not musicians, but people who enjoyed music an awful lot. And my mother uh, sang uh, in choirs and also at church. And uh, as uh, growing up, um, I was supposed to have been taught the piano, but didn't do well with it. And then transitioned to the accordion and did even less with that. Uh, but I did enjoy singing. But uh, you know, the, the interesting thing, when, I, when you're training to fly on something like this beast behind us, uh, there are times that it gets extremely stressful, and uh, it always put in the buds of the earphone, the, uh, the uh, headset, uh, and it calming. It's a, it's very calming for you, and uh, I think you see that uh, just in everyday life with folks who just walk around, and you know they're listening to music there, uh, and it and it it just kind of settles you. And so I think I used uh, music as a training aid because it allowed me to concentrate on the object of the exercise, which was to try to uh, fly a, an orbiter-like discovery and land it successful. And uh, apparently I did that well, so the music worked well for me. Well, one thing that people don't really realize is music is not only an art, but it's also science. Can you explain that to our audience and what, how music is? One of the, uh, when I teach composers in particular, I talk, I talk about understanding music as a series of events in time. And so it could be as simple as understanding how a repetitive pulse, you know, just a ta, 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 could then, those can be grouped into groups. We call that meter. Ta, ka, ka, ta, 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 or ba, ka, ta, ka, 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 into these patterns. And that's just talking about the events themselves. And then you start talking about pitch, which is really frequency and how we experience frequency of vibration. Um, as simple as just a single tone, oh, and then the relationship, oh, oh, that octave is a two to one ratio. And then, oh, oh, that fifth is a two to three ratio. And then all of the different ways that plays on your ear and the way your brain processes those vibrations and how we can experience it. Um, when you go to become a composer and an arranger, the more you understand about how all that math lines up, the stronger your compositions, the more clear your compositions, or if you intend for them to be, quote unquote, more cluttered, you know what to do to make it that way. Studying engineering at the Air Force Academy, did it ever occur to you that even with those failed attempts of your mother to teach you piano, did that come back to you? Well, I, you know, I was just, I was just thinking what, uh, what Michael just said. Uh, everything we did had um, frequency uh, and pitch. And um, whether it was in a musical 
uh, uh, environment or whether it was in preparation to do something, uh, there were a set of guidelines. And, and so those might be the musical scores that you're playing. Um, and that uh, successfully, uh, you, it, 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 I mean, it sounds like a symphony. You know, when you begin putting all of the pieces and parts, all of the people who work, who are all working off of this sheet of music, at the end, you want harmony, you want no chaos. And so I, just sitting and thinking, um, the music and my engineering skills do have a, a connection. One of them is um, you know, the success of a mission. The second is a standing ovation for a, a, a symphony of, of some sort. Well or uh, light jazz, as you were just, play, as you were just playing then. And, and in that, engineering, you're talking radar and sonar, and all of those are frequency and pitch. Uh, and so there is a direct link. You, you can't separate them. Right. Well, I, I, as I was telling Mr. Gregory, I'm working on a gallery right now that talks about living in the space age. We all live in the space age now. But it, it's not just merely the hardware, the technology that gets us there, but it's also our reflections of ourselves and our culture. And you've had the unique opportunity to have music with you while you're in space on the space shuttle. Can you tell me about the kinds of music that you took with you, your wake up calls, and how important that was to you in well, order to, to yeah, accomplish your Yeah, uh, As I said a little earlier, uh, music tends to relax you. And so um, each of us would carry our own um, playlist, I guess. In those days, we didn't call it playlists. We just had a bunch of music. And so I carried uh, uh, Les Miserables with me, uh, The Phantom of the Opera. But I also took the Tops and the Temptations and Aretha. Um, I took um, a, an eclectic amount of music with me. And depending on my, my mood at the time, I had music to cover it. And I can remember, I, in fact, there are movies of me on orbit dancing, floating, and just dancing in, in the air. And uh, with <laughs> when I think back, how everybody was laughing, but everybody was enjoying it. <laughs> so uh, it, it was relaxing for me, but entertaining for the crew. Sure. And it uh, was- Create, Created a memory like nothing else could, actually. It could, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that ultimately led to further encounters with music for you here on Earth well, later on. I did have an opportunity to sing and dance with The Temptations, um, and also it. with James Brown. I was on the stage with him. He danced and sang. I clapped, I think. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's really amazing. Uh, were, you, were you able to exchange musical playlists, your soundtrack, with other astronauts? Were well, we you... would, in those days, we didn't have MP3s. Uh, we used um, CDs. And so uh, we would carry our collection of CDs. Uh, we were beyond eight track at that time. <laughs> so. Everything was CDs, and so we would exchange the uh, CDs on orbit. And uh, it, was, it was always very interesting to see what the other person thought w would have been entertaining. And it, I think by the time we flew, when I flew on Discovery, the crew and I had been working together for about a year, uh, maybe a little bit longer than a year, and it was just amazing how similar our musical tastes were after, that, uh, after the training. And so they didn't have anything unusual at all. In fact, I sometimes wish that I had brought that particular one with me. It was, it was a great time, great time. Great time in sharing adventures. Um, one thing I, I'm curious about, I know that over the years, cosmonauts and astronauts have brought musical instruments with them in space. I, I know cosmonaut Lodakin took a guitar, and of course, most famously, Chris Hadfield played a guitar and sang mm -hmm. um, and recorded um, a song on, while on the International Space Station. Did you have any opportunity to have? Did any of the astronauts on your crews bring instruments to play? Uh, we didn't bring on, on my missions, we had no musical instruments. No, um, on each mission we had a harmonica, a harmonica. But uh, you got me thinking about Ron McNair on Challenger. He, he took a saxophone with him and played. 
Oh, um, wow. Yeah, it was, it was quite an amazing, it was quite a, amazing because all we have actually are photos of him playing. Oh, yeah, nobody caught it. But nobody caught it. Uh, no it, recordings? No, I, as far as I know, there's no recording. I was just wondering, you know, what are the acoustics like up there in space? Well, I know the, the space station is not built for its acoustics. It's, well, the, you know, the space shuttle was a lot smaller. Um, you can see the, the, the volume up here. We had an upper deck and a mid deck. And so it wouldn't have been the most acoustically pure place, but it sure sounded good. It sounded good there. And sometimes the music isn't necessarily about how it sounds. Sometimes it's about just what it feels like to make it happen and what it feels like to, it's to witness beat. it. It's the beat. All of it's it, the yeah. Pitch. And, yeah. And, and the, the joy of just creating, regardless of the result sometimes. Yeah. What would you both hope for as we expand and do longer term flights? What, would mu what kind of music would you like to see on board mm. the space station? or people carry with them beyond bringing their, their personal soundtrack? Mm -hmm. well, we had a, 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 people have asked me, uh, uh, younger, uh, younger kids have asked me, well, what kind of skills do you need to have to fly in space? And I can tell you what the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, Skylab, and, and Space Shuttle uh, but as we begin to expand and begin to begin uh, chasing our imagination to locations, uh, you know, the skills would include teachers, uh, dietitianaries, yeah, uh, musicians. And so I would expect that uh, sooner or later we will, instead of having the London Symphony Orchestra, we would have the Moon Symphony Orchestra. That's right. That's right. Uh, with something done, you know, and, and six gravity up there. I don't think it'll sound different, uh, but you would be able to leap from place to place it would, quickly. It would depend on the medium. You know, the, the uh, pressure of the air and the humidity of the air plays a, a big role in how the sound is able to carry. Um, we know that at a marching band competition, if the air is humid, it's going to be a fun night because the sound just carries yeah. like you wouldn't believe. Over from yeah. your high school into my backyard. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and so the the question would be, when it's less than that, what are, what do we have to deal with? Are we dealing with um, all electronic instruments and headphones on everybody or something like that? Um, you know, another thing I could say is music doesn't sound. Sound is not a necessary characteristic of music. You can make plenty of music with rhythm regardless if anyone can hear it or not. So it could be that we turn into a, a, a way of making musical art that is more to be felt than heard, and that could turn into, turn into a thing. Um, as we're talking about relaxing, there's also focus, there's also creativity, um, and doing things in time, either repetitive as a meditative practice, or as I was talking about my own journey, you build, your, you build yourself as you're building, you build your songs and you, you've learned things about yourself and you've also put new structures in your brain and you're able to do new things because you went through the process. So as we're talking about long-term living off the planet, um, I feel like the well-being of the astronauts will, will probably go up quite a bit if they have different types of ability to make any sort of art, but particularly what all the physical things that come with make, playing an instrument um, and all the mental processes of composing and improvising and putting that all together. Um, and, then, and then the cherry on top will be, we're in this new environment, this expansive environment, and it is the most powerful way to bring home with you your songs and your dance and your culture in the form of music. I just, I can't think of, you know, maybe food would be something that could, could possibly match that. Well, food has been a really, really wonderful example that it has changed over time from just mere basic nutrition that has not been very appetizing to make creating new foods right. that yeah. are advertising. But I think music even digs deeper, as you said. It's an expression of emotions, whether it be listening or creating in both sides. And, and, and holding on to identity, and which is so important. It's so early in the shuttle program before the unfortunate Challenger accident. Uh, it was the intent to carry musicians and artists and and uh, writers to space, and then have them interpret what they saw and what they what what their emotions were, and bring the and the, bring that back. And I hope that uh, one day 
we actually do that, not just carry scientists and engineers, uh, but carry people who can express themselves in a way that the general population and public understand uh, the beauty of it. And that there's still musicians and artists waiting for their opportunity yes. and been, who have been part of the NASA art program and they've incorporated musicians as well. I would guess that with most engineers, if you scratch the surface a little bit, there's a lot more music there than you would might realize and it, it might just take, it's not a matter of necessarily getting a population there that aren't, don't have access to, but it's figuring out how to take the people who are already there and enhancing that part of their experience. It, 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 could, it could be that it's all, we're already ready to do it in some ways. Well, as we've already said, uh, engineering and music are intertwined, and you have, an, I think, of a substantial number of, of astronauts who've had musical training, um, the people who it enhances the engineering training, um, it complements it as well, and I don't know about you, I know my son was delighted to find out that all of his quanti quantitative requirements for college were met by his five years of music theory in my own college. So um, it was very easy to translate that, that knowledge and understanding. That's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, do we have any other que any questions in the audience? Yes. Um, the question was, what, is, what do you feel while in space? What is going through your mind, and how do you feel differently in, while in space than on during a, uh, During ascent, ascent, you're hanging on and just screaming. And so maybe that is music. Maybe the screaming is. Without a doubt it but is. This is uh, Without a doubt but this is. is the excitement of doing something that uh, very few have done before you. In, in our simulations, our simulation gives us about 90% of what we will have, what, what the experience will be. But they save that 10% when you actually get on here. Uh, and it's very difficult to translate. But on, you, you, you talked about moods, and I talked about moods earlier. Uh, depending on the day, depending on the moment, that's when we had different kinds of music, and you would select that particular music. For me, uh, at bedtime, uh, this would be Les Miserables. And I would play Les Miserables every night. And it would, um, you know, at the end of the, when I'd wake up the next morning, the, the CD had completed, but then I would have to wake up to Aretha and so it, it, it kind of depended on where and what you were doing at the moment. But there were some very s specific things that I did, and that worked. Specific kinds of music that I had at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, during the day, depending on what you were doing, um, it varied. You know, I don't. I, that's, the question that's was, a, you know, that's a very, how was the training? Yeah, that's um, a very address anxiety. That, that's a very difficult question. Um, people have asked me, was I afraid? Was I scared? And I qualify it by saying I was probably anxious, but the excitement of the moment kind of overtook anything. So it was too late to get off. So I mean, it wasn't like you could say I'm off of this thing. And so I think you just kind of enjoyed the moment. And the moment to get to space was only of eight minutes. From liftoff until you arrived on orbit is eight minutes. And in that time, you've gone from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in that eight minutes. And so there's a lot of activity, a lot of mental going on at that time. And and as my cousin talks about the beat and pitch, an ascent has beat and it has pitch. And you are just part of it. You are part of this orchestra. 
uh, that um, includes your teammates. It includes this thing back here, the main engines, the big solid rocket bo boosters, and there is a director called Mission Control, a flight director. And the flight director is the one who is orchestrating this, this, this symphony uh, that uh, when you get to orbit and the main engine's cut off, it's wow, okay, that's the first, what do you call it, the first, first measure. Movement, the, yeah, 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 the first yeah. movement. And now you're into the second one. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, the second, and the second one is usually a dance, so that's yeah. that dance around the planet, right? We've, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank you, oh, Doc Nix, Craig Gregory, for your time. I would like to give a special thanks to the Boeing Corporation for sponsoring this series, the STEM in 30 series. And Doc? Um, why don't you tell me about what music you're going to play us out with? Sure, so I had the pleasure of studying uh, on stage I had with me Amy K. Bormant and Matt Diefendorf. Both of them uh, attended the University of Michigan with me when I was working on my doctorate. And we studied group improvisation, so uh, a management style, if you will, um, and, and a way to uh, simultaneously make a plan and execute a plan in real time. Um, so we are going to do an improvisation for you. We don't actually know what we're going to play. Um, I'm inspired thinking about orbit. And um, one of the ideas is you're going fast enough, you would fall, but you're going fast enough that you kind of miss the planet, right? And you just kind of constantly in this state of falling and missing. Um, and we make jazz happen through syncopation. And one of the ways we make syncopation happen is we emphasize a part of the measure that's not what you'd expect. You'd expect us to emphasize count one. So if you're going ba da da bum, ba da da bum, we're gonna make it fancy by not landing. Ba da da bum, de da bum, bum, and make sure that we're dancing all around and never always falling, but never landing. So we're gonna try to do something like that. Well, you know, you gotta land sometime. Uh, <laughs> Moon hasn't landed yet. <laughs> your, your, your time period is wide enough. Who knows what's going to happen? So that's what's about to happen now. Mm. Oh, and I also I brought my mute for the tuba because I think it looks like those capsules over there. So I figured it'd be a good a good tool to use for today. When you woke up this morning, you had no idea you were going to be at a tuba concert, yeah? <laughs> that happens almost every time I perform, actually. Here's what the tuba sounds muted.